Okay, we're just about to start our banking union panel. If you, you would like to join your seats, please. Okay. Um, so first of all, let me let me. Uh, welcome such a distinguished set of uh, panelists and uh, they don't need any introduction but I will still briefly present them. Herk Koenig is the chair of the single resolution board of the single resolution mechanism and if uh, everything goes fine she will have to take care of Edis in a, I hope not so distant future. Uh, Daniel Nui is, as you very well know, is home here, or almost home. Uh, is the chair of the supervisory board of the of the SSM of the single supervisory mechanism at the ECB. Mick uh, Makat here is co-founder and co-director of the Financial Inclusion Center and the chair of the Financial Services Users Group, FSUG. And last but not least, Kos Timmermans is the vice chairman of uh, the board of uh, ENG uh, Bank. So let me, let me kick off your, our discussion with a few introductory remarks and maybe a few words about how I intend to organize this panel. Uh, we have achieved very substantial progress in the setting up of a banking union in, in Europe. The two pillars of the banking union, the two first pillars of the banking union, the single supervisory mechanism and the single uh, uh, resolution mechanisms are uh, now in place. Uh, the uh, SSM since November 2014, the uh, SRM uh, is fully operational, uh, well, we hope, since the 1st of January of this year and is uh, building up the single resolution fund. In October last year, the five presidents issued a report uh, which sets out ambitious plan on how to deepen and complete further the economic and monetary union. And as you know, the banking union is one of the four key pillars in that plan. Shortly after, the Commission has adopted in November a proposal for a European deposit insurance scheme, so-called ADIS, accompanied by a communication which sets out the Commission's vision and concrete set of measures concerning the completion of the banking union, including further steps to share and to reduce risks in the banking uh, sector. So the purpose of the discussion uh, in this panel against this background is to take stock of the progress that were made so far and to identify the most important challenges ahead. So I'd like to organize our discussion around the following three themes, uh, which the speakers will address in, in turn. First, I would like to ask our, our, our panelists uh, to share with us their opinion on what in their view are the most important achievements until now, and in particular in terms of benefits uh, to the economy, and I mean by this households and corporates, but also in terms of financial stability. In other words, is the banking union in its current setup an effective shock absorber? Second, I would like to get their view on uh, how far we've gone and whether we believe that the glass is half full or half empty. 
And finally, to the extent they would conclude it's half empty, which is my strong suspicion, uh, what are the main challenges ahead and what remains to be done to complete the banking union? And I would like to, to hear their views, notably on the number of questions. For example, whether they consider that the current bridge financing arrangements for the single resolution fund are adequate. Uh, how do they see the postponement of the discussion on the common backstop? How do they see the ADIS proposal in that context? And more generally, whether they consider the common safety net sufficiently robust to withstand the period of major financial stress, and if not, what do they recommend? And uh, in terms of risk reduction measures, what uh, should, in their view, be done to address the remaining risks in the banking system? So I suggest that uh, each of uh, the panelists takes uh, uh, no more than 10 minutes for an introductory statement. And then I will open the floor to questions from uh, the audience. And I think that's, uh, that's the best way to have an interesting and uh, interactive uh, uh, session. I think we will have to sufficient time uh, if everybody is disciplined for, for two rounds of three or four each uh, questions uh, Q&A, and then we will uh, conclude. So I'd like first to invite uh, Elke Koenig to make uh, remarks, and then I will uh, go on ladies first uh, uh, with Danielle, then Mick, and uh, finishing with Kos. Thank you, Olivier. Thanks for the nice introduction. I was a bit intrigued to be very short and to say, well, the policy panel here is question mission completed, not yet, but on the way, achievements, multiple, but still more to come. That would be probably the shortest version of my introduction, but let me try to be a bit more reasonable. I think we have achieved really quite a lot. Let's be honest, we have put in place the banking union and we have with the banking union, and I'm now like all of us here a bit sort of focused on the euro area, otherwise it would get too broad. With the banking union, we have put in place the SSM. I won't talk about that because that's Danielle's baby to take care of. And we have now the single resolution mechanism and we have even more as, uh, as important a single rule book with some work still to be done. The third pillar, and you've already mentioned it, would be the harmonized deposit guarantee scheme, which may, should evolve into a common European deposit scheme anytime soon. So these are the three cornerstones. When I look now at what we have achieved with the single resolution board, always centering on what, is, what I'm doing here, then I think we have started and we will support harmonization across the euro area in order to ensure that there is a consistent application of the BRD, the Bank Recovery Resolution Directive provisions, and that we have a very clear, transparent set of rules on burden sharing. We have still some, you could also say, a lot of regulatory work to do. There is still a lot of policies to be spelled out. There's a lot of cross-border work to be done. And let's be fair, it's cross-border, not just with the countries outside the euro area and outside Europe. It is also still a lot of work to be done within the euro area, but I won't go into detail unless that comes up in a question. But one thing is extremely clear. The bank resolution framework changed on January of this year. There was already a bit of discussion about what is going to happen here together with the national partners of the SRB, so the national resolution authorities, we are developing for the moment the standards, policies that will implement the existing, the new legal framework, in particular BRRD and our own single resolution mechanism. And the rules have changed. This is not limited to the buzzwords MREL, TLEC, the commissioner mentioned the work in this field, and even more so, it's also not limited just to consider bail-in. 
But one thing is pretty sure, and you could see that from the market reaction in late last year, earlier this year, we believe that it is extremely important to ensure a consistent and proportionate handling of any resolution case in the banking union going forward, not least to provide certainty to the market participants about the approach. The, least the worst thing to happen is uncertainty, unclarity, intransparency about where within a creditor hierarchy institutions could stay. And this, I think, is what we need to focus on. Looking at this from the end, what needs still to be done? Clearly, it links also BRRD work, it links the, uh, the single resolution mechanism to, well, call it the underlying framework called insolvency law. We don't have a harmonized insolvency law. We have this in 19 versions within the banking union, most coming from Roman law, but having changed over the centuries a bit. But we need to consider that the bank, that the insolvency law is always the basis for our work. So harmonization in that field is, some would call it a low hanging fruit, but low might be relative to where the other fruits are hanging. Yeah. So I would say this is definitely an area to look into and an area where we need to have more achievements. Using your buzzword shock absorber, we have a shock absorber now. We have the single resolution fund, which has to be built up gradually over the next eight years. We have the single resolution fund, nevertheless, entirely as a last resort I can still remember a conference, I think it was the same setup last year, where someone said, is the fund sufficient to solve all structural deficits in banking in the Eurozone? I never thought it was meant for that. It is the last resort and the tool we have at hand for a bank resolution, and it may only be used after at least 8% of total liabilities of the entity under resolution have been bailed in. And in addition, it is limited in its size. Actually, it's kept at 5% of total liability. So it's not the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It is our last resort. We therefore believe that the financial means will be sufficient, the financial means of the fund, to, for future bank failures, subject that the bankings have built up adequate resources in their balance sheet, and this would then mean that we have sufficient MREL set up and banks have done their homework too. With that, I would stop with the question, but no, I can't withstand. It was, I think, not you. It was Jonathan last year who said on the question, is the glass half full or is it half empty? Wrong question. At least we have a glass. And increasingly, the gas is getting filled, and it will probably be more half full than half empty by the end of this year, hopefully. So, but with that, let me move to ADIS, and very shortly, uh, we welcome the ECB EC's proposal for a euro area-wide insurance scheme for bank deposits and setting out further measures to reduce remaining risk in the banking sector in parallel. So both steps. Beside the SSM, beside the SRBM, we need a strong third pillar, and therefore a European deposit insurance scheme must become reality, but it must become reality also fit for purpose. The DGS directive was an important step forwards. Harmonized deposit guarantee schemes are needed and fully funded deposit guarantee schemes. Uh, however, several member states have not yet transposed the DGSD into national legislation, and transposition in member states is, call it patchy or is different. Some use it just as a pay box, some use it to support within a very clear framework transfer of depositors and payment function to another institution to make the 
insolvency procedures fit for purpose. For me, what's crucial, and I think I would leave it with that nearly, is there is a kind of a triangle to be considered. We have with the BRRD, with the SRM regulation, a good system for bank resolution. Still more to do be done, but for a resolution of banks, we have a system. Now, resolution only comes into play under very specific conditions, mainly to preserve financial stability of a member state or the union as a whole, and where there are critical functions for the real economy and for financial stability. In all other cases, reality ought to be, should be, if a bank fails, an insolvency procedure is the next step to go, and you need a strong DGS to make sure that guaranteed depositors are safe. So all three parts of this triangle need to work together. You need to have a fit for purpose insolvency scheme. So good rules and also good effective use of those rules and not ages to come to get something sorted out. And you need to have a DGS. We are always talking about how fantastic the system in the US is that can support the transfer of depositors. Same would hold true when you put it on the European level. And with that, and having seen that I have totally run out of time, I would say we need to strongly advocate not just the risk reduction part of it, we can talk about that later, and I think that's by far more also to Danielle, but also to make the entire system really focused on its purpose in case of a in, so in case a bank gets into trouble to resolve or to put into insolvency this institution in an efficient manner. And with that, I will then stop and go back to the argument. The glass for me is half full, but I think even more important is we have a glass and we need to work that we get more good, solid water into the glass. Thank you, Elke, for having stick almost precisely to your to your 10 minutes, and uh, it's true that before be, 9:56, uh, before we before we had a glass, we put quite a lot of water on the on the soil. So it's good that we have a glass indeed. And my second remark before handing over to Danielle is. Uh, whether insolvency law is a low-hanging fruit depends whether you, it's relatively low if you talk to, to finance ministers, but you will need a big ladder if you talk to justice ministers. So on this note, Danielle. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to join you today for the traditional financial integration conference. As shown in the report published today, the new regulatory and supervisory architecture together with policy, monetary policy measures, has contributed to the reduction in financial fragmentation in the banking union in 2015. But uh, like Kelke said, while we have achieved a lot so far, there are still challenges ahead for the European banking integration. I will try to explain some of them more in details. Uh, let's, uh, let me first quickly start with uh, taking stock of the achievement, as, was, as this was the first point uh, mentioned by Oliver, Olivier. Uh, first, the ECB organized uh, in a short period of time the infrastructure processes on human capital, which allowed its establishment as the single supervisor for the whole euro area. One of our driving uh, principles over the first year of the SSM was to promote uh, the unity and integrity of the internal market based on equal treatment of credit institutions. In parallel to the institutional setup, the ECB immediately focused on ways to ensure quality, effectiveness, and consistency of supervision, as well as undertook important horizontal projects to support its action. First, consistency was needed across banks and countries in the way supervisors assess the prudential situation of each bank, target individual weaknesses, and make the banks hold extra capital. 
Therefore, the ECB set in place a harmonized methodology for the main instrument of banking supervision, the supervisory review and evaluation process, in short, SREP. Banks with higher risk must hold more capital, and the playing field has been considerably leveled within the euro area, which is a very positive development for banks themselves. Second, divergence was identified not only in supervisory practices, but also in the regulatory environment itself. Thus, the ECB initiated the SSM project on option on national discretions in order to tackle as a priority diverging treatments across banks and countries. These policies were translated into implementing instruments, including an ECB regulation, which will become operational within 2016. This is a very important step as it means that significant banks within the SSM will be operating under an harmonized regime and will be treated in a consistent manner by their joint supervisory teams when, for example, submitted, uh, submitting applications for waivers, exemptions, or approval. I will now turn to the priorities for 2016 and challenges ahead. Not surprisingly, business model on profitability risk remain a key priority in 2016. Credit risk also remains one of our key priorities due to the persistently high level of non-performing loans in a number of euro area countries. We will also uh, investigate excessive risk concentrations in such areas such as real estate. On a strongly related issue is the implementation of the new accounting standards, IFRS 9, for financial, financial instruments, which has a bearing on the measurement of credit impairments, as well as the valuation of financial instruments. Another priority for 2016 is capital adequacy. Of particular relevance in this regard are the consistency and quality of banks' internal capital adequacy assessment process, ICAP, on their internal stress testing capacities. The follow-up on the quality and composition of banks' capital, also in relation to uh, national options, is important as well, including also uh, the examination of banks' preparedness for new regulatory standards, such as the MREL and TILAC. And obviously, the targeted review of banks' internal capital on their risk-weighted intensity uh, is an important part as well of the solvency uh, priority. Regarding banks' governance, risk governance, a priority now for the SSM is to clearly communicate supervisory expectations vis-a-vis -vis the banks in this respect. Furthermore, automatic review will assess compliance with the Basel Committee principles for effective risk data aggregation and risk reporting. Finally, liquidity is a new supervisory priority in 2016. The experience of the 2015 SREP has shown that many banks do not yet fully meet supervisory expectations regarding sound management of liquidity. <laughs> For the sake of time, I will not comment further or work on national options on non-performing exposures, but I would like to stress that the most important goal uh, underlying all supervisory action is ensuring public confidence in the banking system. The new European recovery and resolution rules are supporting this goal and have been tested in the resolution of some less significant institutions in Italy, Greece, and Portugal so far. The ECB has cooperated intensively with national authorities in major phases of the relevant processes, in particular with uh, authorizations of bridge banks and withdrawal of failing banks, licenses of failing banks. I will not uh, comment further on this, but use it as a transition uh, regarding the interplay with the SRM. The supervisory authorities have several new tools to ensure the, uh, improved resilience of banking institutions. These tools include, for example, the imposition of early intervention measures in case the bank's situation in is deteriorating without being properly addressed. In addition to these powers, the Bank Recovery and Resolution Directive introduced a number of provisions which make banks safer. Importantly, uh, resolution authorities have to set up credible resolution plans, which can be implemented in the event of resolution. 
and resolution planning comprise, comprises a resolvability uh, assessment, which requires removing any impediment to resolvab resolvability ex ante, for example, by imposing uh, changes to the legal and operational structure of a bank. Thus, the resolution authority has the responsibility on the means to reduce the complexity and interconnectedness of big banks, uh, which in my view, on depending on the institution-specific characteristic, could also improve banks' risk management and enhance supervisory objectives. But I don't develop more. This is uh, Elke's territory. She will uh, tell you more about this. Regarding uh, the European Deposit Insurance Scheme, uh, I think it's quite uh, important because uh, SSM and SRB, SRM meant a quantum lift uh, for enhanced integration. The establishment of uh, European Deposit Insurance Scheme is the missing third pillar of the banking union. So we also, uh, to make it uh, work, as Elke said, we also need to agree on a public backstop for the single resolution fund. In my view, when banks are being submitted to a single set of rules, subject to a single supervisory framework, there is no reason to treat depositors differently across borders. Hence, deposits have to inspire the same level of confidence wherever they are uh, located. So to conclude, uh, overall, much has been achieved, and I would say that the glass is rather half full than half empty, but the road uh, does not uh, end here. And to a certain extent, I have the, the, the view that it is a kind of magical glass. The more you do, the more you seem to have to do. Uh, uh, so the, this empty so part is, gro is growing. Uh, still, uh, still full because we did more than we dreamed to do at the very beginning. I, I'm surprised that we have been uh, able to achieve so much in such a small period of time. But there is uh, so much uh, more to do that there is no uh, room uh, for complacency. <coughs> thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Daniel, and thank you for having uh, outperformed uh, Elke by almost a minute. So, gentlemen, oh. uh, the, the benchmark is very high for you. Um, <laughs> no, I was interested. It is indeed, I mean, it reminds me of uh, the meet the Sisyph. So you can you carry back the exactly. stone at the top of the mountain, and you you always have to do exactly. it again. And as much as you you put water in the glass, it is still a full or half empty, no, depending on whether you're optimistic or not. That uh, simply means so work is never finished. All right. Uh, so the next in line, no, I forgot. Uh, I think was Mick. That's right. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Because cost finishes. So. You have 10 minutes, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much, folks, for the opportunity to put the, the consumer perspective on banking and capital market union integration. This is really, really important. You know, if, if integration was measured by the amount of policy activity, then we, sh we, you know, we would be okay. You, you know, the, the glass would be over, overflowing. But, uh, <laughs> but I have to say, look, you know, policy activity is not the same as an effective integrated single market. So whenever we're talking about the glass being half full or whatever, you know, we're, we haven't even begun the journey of integrating European financial markets from the point of view of the end user, whether that's households or real economy firms. So those are two very different things. You know, I, I, I congratulate <coughs> my colleagues here. I congratulate the staff and the commission who've done a great job and the staff in the European Central Bank. They have done some great, they've introduced some great policy measures but as i say activity is not the same as outcomes from the perspective of consumers or real economy firms now instead of thinking about it in terms of you know is what is there one glass half full or half empty what you really have to think about here is that there are four glasses now i'll explain what i mean now if you think for financial markets are very large and very complex but essentially they undertake four primary functions there's only four things they're supposed to do. The first one is transactional and banking facilities for households and real economy firms. The second function, the second primary function is to make sure that capital gets from where it is to where it's needed in the most economically and socially useful way. That's the asset allocation function and the asset gathering function and the asset management function. And my colleague, Gwian Price, I'm sure will actually go into more detail about the asset management function. 
The third primary function of financial markets is uh, credit creation and financial intermediation so that households and real economy firms can get access to the, the appropriate short and long term credit that they need. And then the fourth primary function is actually risk management and insurance. Again, this is a vital part of the financial system because without that fourth primary function, then real economy firms cannot conduct real, real economy activities. Now, from my, from my perspective then, you know, is the market integrated successfully from the point of view of uh, consumers and real economy firms? Then I think only on the first one, on the transactional banking activity, can we say there has been any significant progress in terms of an integrated market from the point of view of consumers. On the other three main activities, the asset allocation, uh, credit creation, financial intermediation, and risk management, there has not been significant integration from the point of view of uh, the real economy or for, for households. And why, why is that? Uh, well, look, you know, you know, there's a number of reasons, but uh, let, let me just try and highlight some of the reasons why this has not happened uh, from the perspective of, 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 of the end user. Well, the first one is, uh, and, and in doing so, I'll explain what has to be done if we do want to integrate the markets. Well, the first one is really is that we need, we need structural and institutional reform. What do, what do I mean by that? This is actually very simple if you think about it. If you think about the, the, le the, 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 the amount of financial activity that is undertaken in the financial system, the vast majority of that financial ac activity in the banking sector is actually there for the purposes of other financial institutions. Only a small minority of financial activity is undertaken for the benefit of the real economy. Just to give you a, a quick example, uh, I think the 75% uh, uh, 70, of global, global investment bank revenues have been derived from selling services to other parts of the financial system. Just one quarter has been derived from selling services to real economy firms. Something like only 7% of uh, interest rate over the counter, over, over the counter uh, interest rate derivatives are actually derived from real economy activities. And certainly in my, in, in where I'm based in the UK, something like only 8% of bank lending actually went to real economy firms. The vast majority of bank lending goes to other financial institutions or else it goes into non-productive assets like property. So the, the big structural problem here we have uh, uh, in terms of the single market is that too much financial activity goes to other parts of the financial system. And uh, the, the banking sector does not have the right incentives or the right structures to actually be compelled to focus on providing services to real economy firms. So we will not have an integrated single market unless we ta tackle those structural barriers and those incentives that still cause institutions to focus on other financial institutions. So forget, you'll forget about integration until you tackle the structural barriers in the, in the market. I think the second, um, the second type of uh, intervention we need, you know, I mean, if, if we are serious about you know, incentivizing alternative providers to come into the market to compete against dominant providers, then we're simply gonna have to clear space for those alternative providers. There is no evidence that I can find the competition itself or market forces themselves will actually incentive or actually create the conditions for alternative better value providers to take on the big dominant providers in the European Union. So unless we actually clear space, then alternative providers will not be able to compete and take market share of the dominant providers in different uh, local countries. I think the, the, the third set of interventions really is around a new approach to conduct of business regulation. Now you might wonder why am I raising the issue of conduct of business when we're really talking about financial stability and competition and integration. It's very, very simple actually. If you have poor conduct of business regulation, that distorts markets and it actually distorts the efficient allocation of resources as well because the actual the cost of doing certain types of business have not priced in to the activity. You know, it's what economists would call the externalities are not, are not priced in. And this is why, this is one of the reasons why we still have the focus on non-productive financial market activities. So unless you tackle the conduct in markets, you will not get economically efficient allocation of resources either. So there's clearly a set of, uh, there's clearly a set of uh, regulatory issues around the, the, the conduct, the culture, and competition 
in financial markets that we really need to improve if we are to see markets working from the point of view of consumers. Now, the, the, the la one, of the, one of the sort of the last final point, on, uh, one of the two final points I make really is that uh, when we submitted our evidence to the, the, the Commission on Capital Markets Union and uh, the retail market integration, one of the biggest barriers we found to an effective single market was behaviours in local markets. You know, quite simply, this is one of the biggest barriers to market integration because if you're sitting in one country and you have a really good value product or a really good value proposition, the failure of supervisors to enforce and implement regulation in another member state acts as a huge barrier to those better value providers taking market share from poor value local dominant providers. So unless we have a framework, uh, you know, an EU-wide horizontal framework of regulation that works, but that has to be built on an effective framework of local supervision as well, because unless you have local supervision, then you can, again, that will undermine the, uh, the ability of a cross-border single market. So there's the, fi the final point, as well as uh, conduct, culture, competition, the fourth C really is confidence building measures as well. Now, I won't go into much detail on these, you know, but uh, you know, we, we, certainly we certainly support the, the establishment of a single European deposit insurance scheme. That's a, that, is a, that, is, that is a much needed measure, so we, we congratulate the, 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 the policy makers on that. But, but we're also clearly going to have to look at sort of harmonizing regulation, have more consistent regulation, particularly, particularly around insolvency law as well. So unless we actually tackle that conduct, the conduct, the culture, the competition, and the confidence in the markets, then we are a long, long way from having an effective integrated single market. Thank you. You made a point in being just as effective as Danielle, so thank you very much for this. <laughs> um, but just a, a a remark on, on something you said. I mean, it's true that a small proportion of bank activity, functional market activity in general, goes to uh, so-called real economy uses. Uh, but I think conversely, what is this one thing that the financial crisis showed <coughs> is that the financial economy is real as well in terms of how big the problems in financial economy translate to the so-called <laughs> real economy. Um, so that, that might be, but I suppose we will, we will tackle Just a this. Bit, but don't, don't forget, of course, what, what, what people have always said and, and what, what has become apparent because of the crisis is that the rewards are privatised and risks were socialised, you know, but the, the level of financial market activity that relates to other financial institutions is way out of proportion to the share of, the fina of financial services in the real economy. There's a, a serious imbalance still in the markets at the moment. And the, the other small point that I noted from in your presentation is, uh, is I think the point you made on, the, on various applications of standards across countries mm -hmm. is probably more true, uh, it's, it's true across the board, but it's probably more true in, in markets uh, than in banking. Mm -hmm. uh, at least is my, is my feeling the degree of heterogeneity is, is wider. This is one of the issues we want to tackle in capital market union. Uh, there is some degree of heterogeneity in banking supervision as well, and this is why in Basel we're mm -hmm. taking care of the fundamental review of the trading and the banking book. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the problem is, uh, is of uh, lesser magnitude. So, Kos, a view from the banks. Yeah, maybe um, a couple of comments to clarify. Um, our banks, uh, I work for ING, and uh, you know, maybe explain a few things about it. First, if you look at our balance sheet, approximately 65% of our balance sheet is in customer lending, so end customer lending. Um, around 15% is in liquidity, and we need to hold that liquidity also because we are raising deposits. So that leaves a significant amount actually where we do measure are we doing end customer business. Derivatives, maybe that part we can uh, discuss later as well. We do quite a lot of derivatives, but it's also embedded in our products eh, where we sell mortgages to our clients. We do need a fair bit of derivatives to hedge that risk. Maybe if I explain ING further, two things. Um, we are big subsidiaries in the Benelux and in Germany, but we also run branching operations in Italy, Sp uh, Spain and France. So truly, European bank with many operations. Um, maybe four things to clarify from my part. 
first uh, view on the banking union, where we are and what still needs to be developed in our view. Maybe also talk a bit about digitalization, uh, because there it's interesting that Danielle mentioned the fact that the glass gets bigger, and indeed, the glass gets bigger. <laughs> um, the other point, fintech, glass gets bigger, even bigger. And then maybe we can lastly also talk a few things about low interest rate, because that gives a bit the context of where we operate in. If I go to the banking union overall, what I see is uh, a lot of things have been achieved and, uh, you know, in that sense, uh, you know, many good things, many standardizations, but also more trust in a sector. So in that sense, we are quite happy. Few things where we can still improve. One is um, if you look at integration of capital and liquidity, the question is, are we already allocating demand and supply of deposits and loans on a European scale? The answer is not yet. Uh, there's a few obstacles in between. So um, I dream of a European bank who says like, hey, I'm raising deposits where I'm efficient raising deposits and I'm generating loans anywhere in Europe where I'm good at that. Um, there is quite a bit of capital markets in between, which is still not necessary. Uh, so if we raise too much deposits in Germany, via the capital markets, it is invested, and we borrow in the capital markets in other units where we make more loans. And to be honest, we like to get that piece of capital markets out because then we can make our balance sheet even more than 65% customer loans because we want to have as much as possible that area. So large exposure regime is still an area where we believe we can improve on because that makes simply balance sheets shorter and more focused on deposits and loans. The other part where I think still some improvements could be uh, created is if you start to look at the national option still there. So if we, for instance, look at macro prudential buffers, buffers in some countries is higher than in others, and we hope, for instance, with ADIS, that some of these buffers gets harmonized as well. Because please know that um, if you look at do we as a bank have pricing power on all of our assets, the answer is not. So you do want to have some form of level playing field moving further. Maybe the other area to look at, and that is not so much an ECB or a Europe thing, but if you look at it holistically, we have an FSB who is creating some rules like the TLEC. We have Basel still coming up with Basel three and a half. We have an ECB who formulates SHREP, and we have the national regulators who might create top-ups. The question is, um, there is sometimes still an element of not coordination between, eh, because what you could have is that on top of your SREP buffers and your uh, national discretion uh, supervisory buffers and your TLEC that you start to say like, can we all as an institution manage these things at the same time and absorb them? Uh, and sometimes we'd like to have, uh, but, but I don't know how to create that, some more coordination between the different governing bodies who are in the end impacting a financial institution like ours. ADIS we maybe talked about briefly. Um, still shortly, if you look at MREL and TLEC, one of the concerns what we still have is, are we going to implement that on a consolidated basis or are we going to implement that on a country for country basis? We hope, of course, the first one, because otherwise you end up issuing securities in all countries where you don't want to issue securities. Uh, because, I mean, in the end, you want to keep balance sheets a bit tidier. So overall, many things achieved, still a few things to be done, I would say, on the regulatory part. But now maybe on the magical glass, if you look at digitalization. Uh, overall, digital channels important. Um, make one of the points with consumers is, is one of our major worries is consumers are not visiting our branches. How do we still stay in contact with them? Because we have a duty of care rule and that is not so easy by only looking at an account. Uh, so one of the big challenges we have is how can we connect with a customer, do fair business with them, but also do it in a decent way. We do like the competition on that part, for, for sure, in the digital part. Uh, one of the areas to look at, particularly in Europe, is the customer onboarding. So here the glass gets a bit bigger, 
because if we, for instance, want to welcome Italian customers in the Netherlands, but still you need to bring your personal ID, well, you cannot expect the client to come up with his passport, drive all the way to the Netherlands to become a customer of ours. So, for instance, Spanish and German video onboarding practices could be a good thing to adopt. Mm -hmm. The other thing uh, what you'd like to see is, it was mentioned this morning, interoperability between net networks. So we have the nice IBAN number network, but what you start to see is you get more peer-to-peer -peer payment networks right now. Somewhere they need to interconnect with the IBAN network as well. So on these areas you could say digitalization starts to play a role and starts to give demand for new rules. Question. Um, what you will get is EBAN, all kind of, uh, you know, nice fintechs will create applications where telephone numbers will get connected to EBANs. Do we want to share that more or are these all little individual networks? If you want to make a big step, sharing could be one of the things which is good. At the same time, of course, we need to respect the part that we all have to care about the privacy. Um, Maybe on the fintechs, one of the things what is a concern somewhat for the banks is we are the holders of the customer account. So that means we need to do the CDD, the CSR, the FATCA, uh, the tax due diligence. Um, all of these things are nice, but not necessarily from a customer perspective, the biggest value enhancing thing. And what you find is the fintechs are not so much interested in the accounts, they are more interested in doing the payments. So they like to offer the, the customer the nice uh, payment experience, which I can understand. At the same time, some of the worries we have with PSD2 is the fact that if those payments are done by fintechs, allowed by customers, um, what happens if something goes wrong? Is it then the banks who have to compensate for the fintechs and go and chase the, the, the fintech in this case? Sometimes we feel that the rules on this are a bit unbalanced and you get a bit, uh, you know, in the utility role as a bank only. And of course we want to treat our clients well as well. Maybe one part on low interest rates. Um, why do I mention that one? Um, right now we are still at the level of the capital and the new capital rules implementation. At the same time, we also know that given low interest rates, banks are in going to face a more an environment of narrowing margins, which is fine, but which also means that we then need to make sure that we take actions in terms of operational levels. So more standardizing platforms, more sharing uh, things, and that could sometimes hamper the part of the resolution because does it make you more resolvable or not? But operational efficiency is one of the mm -hmm. things we clearly need to work on if you know, given the environment right now. Because please for, don't forget that, in fact, we have from a customer perspective a negative yield curve. Eh? In a lot of countries, we are still paying for deposits a higher rate than the Euribor curve based lending what we do. And in a negative yield curve environment, and that will continue for a while, it means margin erosion, and it means that we need to take quite a lot of efficiency measures going forward. So that's a bit the environment in which we are, and that's a bit the context in which we have to operate. And uh, that gives us quite some challenges. Nevertheless, I would still say lots of things achieved, uh, still many things to be, t uh, be done, but at the same time, be fearful a bit Sorry. of the Oops. silo part between <laughs> all the different rules. That's okay. just your one minute reminder. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I shall do. <laughs> Thank you, Gus. I found a very effective way to, to draw your attention on my one minute uh, paper. Uh, excellent. Um, well, I will know, I mean, we have uh, heard a lot of food for thoughts. Uh, I guess there is a lot of questions burning your lips. I see a gentleman already already here. Uh, while the, the, the microphone translates to you, uh, I, uh, I would like to uh, uh, take the point that uh, Kos made on the digitization. Uh, so, does you, but first of all, should the, should the supervisors uh, uh, care about it, do anything about it? And if yes, what? I'd like to get Daniel's view on this. And also, I mean, having worked in the competition field for 20 years, 
I have to say, I always found that some of the arguments of the banks in the safety of interface, which are, I mean, it's a genuine issue, but it's also uh, quite handy uh, to protect uh, existing positions and prevent new entry uh, in the market. So I suppose there is a, a balance to be found between safety and, uh, and fostering entry. Danielle? Yes, for sure. Uh, I, I think, first of all, we have to uh, understand how it works, digit digitalization, and what are the challenges, what are the, the promises uh, offered by these uh, new developments. Uh, second, we have to make sure that uh, uh, the IT of the banks is up to the, the challenges and up to the, the standards uh, it has to... Uh, to be able to, to resist uh, hackers attacks, for example, uh, cyber crime uh, on other possible uh, weaknesses of uh, digitalization. But I think it's uh, uh, a great opportunity for, for the banks. Uh, indeed, the, the, the profitability is uh, hit. Uh, the banks are hurt in their profitability by, uh, in general, low interest rates and or uh, legacy assets, sometimes both. Uh, and that's a good way of uh, get a better profitability to work on the cost uh, to income ratio, which is pretty high in uh, European uh, banks and SSM banks. So uh, this is an opportunity, uh, but it has to be, uh, to be used properly. And there are big differences between the banks that use it well and the ones that are not uh, using it uh, enough, in my view. Thank you, Daniel. So, sir, you had a question. The <laughs> microphone is on its way. Please identify yourself and disclose your affiliation. I'm Franco Bruni from Bocconi University. Uh, to, to secure uh, ex ante the stability of the European banking system, I see a lot of complementarity between three different uh, pool of funds. One is the deposit insurance fund. The other one is the single resolution fund. But there's a third pool of fund which uh, should serve for systemic shocks, and that is the European Stability Fund, the European Stability Mechanism, uh, to the extent that its statute uh, allows the mechanism to intervene for direct recapitalization of banks. This function has been blocked at a certain point. Now, as far as I understand, it hasn't been still unblocked. I wonder if you have any comments on that, if, you, if uh, given the difficulty to do to tell, uh, uh, to tell, if you want, uh, idiosyncr idiosyncratic from, from systemic shocks, we do not need the, the backing of this potential f powerful function of the ESM in order to be sure to guarantee the stability uh, also at the micro level. Thank you. Well, thank you for that question. I mean, that reverts to a question I asked in my introductory remark, but that very wisely my colleagues did not pick up. Uh, and it's, it's, it's all about the backstop to the system. Mm. Um, we need a backstop to the system. We need a backstop to the SRF. Uh, the member states have decided to postpone the discussion. They are now reconsidering in the framework of the overall balance between risk reduction and risk sharing whether to reopen it uh, rather sooner than later. I think the issue of the backstop not only to the SRF but also to the uh, EDIS uh, will come, so what we need ultimately is a backstop to the banking union. At least that is the view of the Commission, and I understand from the integration report that is also the view of the ECB, which is not surprising because this was the view expressed by the five presidents in the report, and among the five presidents you had President Juncker and President Draghi. But I hope you're burning to take the floor, so. <laughs> Not sure that I'm burning to take the floor, but I would slightly try to balance it. Take our old example, glass half full, glass half empty, or not even a glass. I think the SRF has to be built up over time. The SRF has put in place, or the member states have put in place, loan facility agreements for the SRF for the interim time. We are, for the time being, executing those first agreements one by one. DGS to be put in place by the member states first. And clearly, you can always consider to get a backstop, but the backstop is under discussion. I hope that technical work on that will start soon to consider it. 
But my main f message will always be start working on reducing the risk with a good resolution planning, start working on having a fit for purpose DGS and insolvency law, that part of it, and don't start working with it always from saying I need someone who is paying the bill if something goes wrong. So for me, ESM also is at the end, happy to have it, but it is not the front part of our work. Does any of the other panelists want to cross? Yeah, maybe on this part. So uh, the first uh, thing what we always see in terms of buffers is your own profitability, then your discretion in your capital, which you still have right now. Mm -hmm. Then you come to the TLEC and the MREL, and then you come, and which which is already more than 10 times bigger than the, uh, the, yeah. the, the, the resolution <laughs> fund. Um, and to be honest, also, uh, it's a bit what Elke is saying, we rather have clarity in the market that TLEC and MREL means loss absorption. And if you start to talk too much about all the things behind there, then people start to doubt the loss absorption. I rather have clarity on that part. And it's a big buffer. I mean, it's a double in, in effect of capital anyway. Yeah, I think that's imp we don't live in the same world as some years ago. That is clear. So I uh, okay. So I have said it five times, as requested by Elke. Uh, <laughs> But at, and at the same time, you, you very well see that this, there is an issue of moral hazard here, and there is a, a, a relationship between the two. I mean, this is basically, if I should characterize the position of the member states, it's a, it's a continuum that goes from let's share all the risk up front now uh, onto uh, let's put in place uh, backstops and, uh, and uh, funds and all risk sharing arrangements where there is no risk to share anymore, and then we'll be happy to do it. And of course, the, 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 uh, the reality is somewhere in between. Uh, risk sharing and risk reduction needs to go hand in hand. And you need to reduce, we need to reduce the risk. We still need to reduce further the risks in the banking system. And at the same time, we need to share the risk because sharing the risk is also one of the ways to reduce it. I saw a gentleman that had a question over there. Hello, uh, Matthias Thiemann, Goethe University, Frankfurt. Um, I would like to take up a point that Mr. Meketeer made, and I think uh, in relation to what also Mr. Timmermans said, uh, t uh, Mr. Timmermans was speaking about the attempt to reduce capital market requirement, like doing it all inside of the bank rather than borrowing and loaning. Mr. Meketeer pointed out that so much activity is going to other financial institutions rather than to what he called the real economy. And that's why I wanted to ask uh, the supervisor as well as the person responsible for resolution, where are we in decreasing the interconnectedness in the financial system? Because that helps resolution, makes it much easier, and that helps supervision. Is that something that is still a goal that is pursued? How do you assess the effect of the liquidity coverage ratio? Where do you think this is going? Um, thank you. So maybe Danielle and then Elke. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yes, uh, in, uh, in this, um, two points. Uh, indeed, uh, the, the capital market part uh, uh, is not important enough uh, in Europe, and we support uh, strongly the, the, the different uh, building blocks uh, of the capital union. We have to promote capital union. That's an important part as well. Uh, and I uh, see that uh, things are, are moving, and not only on uh, securitization, which is uh, an important element. Uh, regarding the interconnectedness, well, this is work in progress, uh, because uh, the single resolution mechanism has been an important step in uh, reducing interconnectedness uh, between uh, the sovereigns and the banks, for example. Uh, the directive that uh, makes sure that there is uh, much less, if not at all, uh, bailing out and more uh, bailing. Uh, also, uh, the creation of a uh, single resolution fund that was mentioned. Once we have a deposit guarantee scheme, very important as well to, to reduce the interconnectedness. Uh, 
and uh, another important part as well uh, is related to the, the treatment of sovereign risk. And as you know, this has been uh, discussed uh, in the last uh, ECOFIN meeting. So there is a, a lot of work uh, in progress in this field, and I'm quite optimistic that we will uh, reap the first benefits uh, quite fast. Not all of them, but the, at least first on gradually all the benefits. Let me perhaps address more the focus, uh, put the focus more on interconnectedness within the financial sector. Clearly, and again, so you've said it five times, I add it, since the financial crisis, a lot has happened. We should not forget that some products that created part of the interconnectedness have disappeared. So part of it just doesn't exist in that form anymore. But clearly we are for the time being within the single resolution board based on the recovery plans that banks have prepared that, were, that are looked into by the ECB and by us when we focus on the 120 banks, looking into resolution plans. And part of the resolution planning is defining the critical functions of these banks, defining interconnectedness, and trying and starting step by step to address it, side by side with the argument about how much capital as a whole, so MLEG, TLEG is needed. So this is work in progress. I think it is by far better sketched out today than it has ever been in the past. Is it entirely reduced? No. And I would actually add, I think you won't want to avoid it in totality. We don't want to go back into a world where you have single banks stand, standing alone and then the attractive part of the business, which needs larger interconnected banks, has to go somewhere, and the risk comes home. I think the, the, the latest point is quite important. Kaz, did you want to add something? Yeah, maybe one point on this, because you also mentioned LCR. Um, one of the things is, if you look at yourself also as a consumer, in general, you make your money available shorter to a bank than the loan you want to pick up, because the loan is a mortgage is 30 years, hence the transformation function. What you see right now is that parts of our balance sheet will move more towards investors, which also means that investment funds, they will start from time to time. If money is taken out of funds, they'll have to force liquidate some assets. So what you will see is part of the transformation function of a bank will migrate more towards credit spread or a price volatility of bonds in a market. Eh? And you cannot completely uh, get away from this because that has to do with the nature of the supply and the demand of money, which is just of a different character in the, you know, in this world. And that part will stay. It's only now spread out over a bigger group. Thank you. We had a question in the first row, and that was not from Philip. But Philip has a question, I think. <laughs> Uh, all of you, I suppose, but particularly for Daniel Nui and, uh, and Elke. Um, what is the uh, position of the uh, ECB uh, with respect to the ongoing discussions uh, in, in Basel for what you refer to as remaining to be done and what we bankers refer to as Basel IV, and I know you don't like the, the expression, uh, particularly with respect to internal models, to uh, versus standard models, uh, flaws, uh, RWA uh, methodology, but I would also want to expand that to where we stand with respect to the MREL and, uh, and the TLAC, because these are all very important issues when it comes to uh, investors. And uh, as you know, uh, we banks, we are in the hands of our investors when it uh, uh, refers to calibrating products, uh, seeking equity, bonds, and whatnot. So this is very, very crucial. Uh, we need to get out of this uncertainty, and the sooner the better. So the, you nicely distributed the, uh, the <laughs> questions between Daniel <laughs> and, and I, I, I'd, I'd like to, to add something, yes. It's, uh, I, I'd like to, to hear Daniel's view and uh, how practically uh, will be implemented the uh, policy lines of the GHOS that the exercise doesn't result in average in a, in a substantial uh, uh, hiring of the uh, of the uh, minimum requirements? Well, uh, 
Personally, I have nothing against uh, models. Uh, I, I spent uh, five years of my professional life in Basel, uh, preparing Basel II, and I was sharing the, the models task force. But uh, we want uh, good models that are fully understood by the banks that use them, uh, not a model that is uh, built by a consultant, uh, giving the key uh, to, to the bank. Uh, also well monitored, supervised by the supervisors. Uh, the, the worst situation would be a bank using a consultant to build a model and the supervisor using another consistent consultant to, uh, to validate the models. Uh, and not only uh, well validated, but well maintained, which uh, maintenance has to be adequate, uh, which has not always been the case, uh, in particular during the crisis, because banks had uh, other priorities. So uh, right now, we very much uh, welcome the, the discussions in Basel regarding uh, models. Uh, we want models uh, producing uh, adequate uh, risk requirement, uh, adequate risk-weighted assets, and uh, consistent uh, risk-weighted asset uh, when we compare the, the different banks. Uh, if the, there might be different uh, risk-weighted assets, but uh, provided there is a good explanation for that, that the risk profile of the bank is no, of the two banks that we compare are not the same, for example. So uh, this is what we expect from Basel. And as a matter of fact, the work has already uh, started. We have a project which is uh, reviewing all the models, the thousands of models that have been uh, validated uh, across the uh, SSM countries uh, on banks. Perhaps let me add to the, <coughs> your question on, or let me try to answer your question on Emerald TLEC. We have from the beginning said those are two sides of the same coin. We fully acknowledge that investors, markets need clarity on those. At the same time, from an institutional point of view, let's be uh, clear, EMREL is an entity by entity, group by group decision. So we have started out in early January with a presentation where we set out kind of, I would call the frame within which Emerald decisions will be taken. They will be taken over the latter part of this year as part of the resolution plans of the individual institutions. Will it be, and I'm always citing my colleague who once said it's a journey, not sure how many volunteers we have for the journey, but uh, <laughs> it is definitely a journey. We will set Emerald targets, we will have a quantitative component, a qualitative component, so there will be the famous issue of subordination in, and there will be a time component to this, to make sure until when this all can be implemented. No one is expecting it to happen yesterday. So TLEC, on the other hand, was the FSB paper, and I think Olivier and I share a time of TLEC debate and at some point also probably TLEC fatigue. But to be fair, when you look into the TLEC minimum standard for GSIPs, you find a lot of foot for thought and criteria which we will see and implement into our EMRAL decision for the GSIPs, but definitely beyond, because these are consideration you come along when you consider whether an institution is resolvable. And part of resolvability is also, do you have the chance to act on the famous weekend without legal doubt and be sure that you're in your decisions can be enacted on a Monday morning. So there is still a lot to come. We try to be transparent. We will probably come with more information, more generalized information over the summer. And perhaps for transparency, one thing is coming true. We have started a quite an extensive data collection because transparency about banks' liability structure is mm -hmm. called its friendly limited for us, but also for the market. So from my side, for the outside, one area already to work on is having better de uh, data readiness on the liability side 
and to consider from a bank's perspective <coughs> on how to provide clarity to markets about creditor hierarchy and the question of who comes first in line after equity. It's not rocket science, it's just a question of transparency. I will stop here. So I still have four questions on my list, so I will close. Don't even raise your finger anymore. And I ask short questions, and if possible, short answer. Um, the blonde lady on my right-hand side. Uh, thank you very much. Marina Brogi, Sapienza University. Actually, this, I think, fits in nicely with what's just been said. I was wondering whether you could give us a few more details on the no creditor was off principle, which to some extent will have to be, from what I gather from reading uh, the, the documentation, will have to be proved once you have actually opted for recovery, for resolution, as opposed to the normal insolvency procedure. So what sort of documentation do you think that would have to be prepared and by whom? Thank you very much. I guess this one's for you, Elke. <laughs> Let me try to be fair. Indeed, no creditor worse off is to some extent the elephant in the room. Resolution is nothing else than a specific insolvency procedure. So within resolution, when you do a bail-in, you have to prove that the creditor is not worse off than in an insolvency procedure. Gets you back to 19 different countries with 19 different insolvency laws and a lot of work to be done individually as part and as a core part of the resolution plan we are working on. Thank you, short and effective. Uh, the gentleman next, yeah, thank you. Federico Cornelio, Italian Banking Association. Um, in 2008, we started a, a crisis um, by means of uh, level three assets and the structured products that were in some banks balance sheets and they created uh, a little mess. Uh, after a, a number of years, we have had now new tools and we welcome the work of the SSM and on the others. And, but um, talking about risk reduction, we wonder if we could wipe away the risk of uh, uh, non-liquid structured products that still are in some uh, banks in order to enhance the trust uh, that we have each other's. If we look at the priorities of the SRM, uh, we, we would like to, to, to see how, how are you trying to detect it on a quantitative way rather than on a qualitative way. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, gladly. Uh, well, indeed, when we are uh, discussing non-performing exposures, uh, loans to corporates or loans to individuals, quite often uh, we are asked, on what do you do with the legacy assets of the trading book? Uh, in fact, uh, maybe because they are market uh, assets on the shorter uh, maturities or maybe be because the, the losses were, were bigger, uh, whatever the reason, in fact, uh, it happens that this has been addressed much, uh, much faster, in fact. It's not uh, well known because there was uh, no good story to, to, or no story to, to, to tell around it, but during the comprehensive assessment, we have made an in-depth analysis of the trading books of the, the, the banks having significant uh, trading books. And we, in, the, in this uh, assessment, we focused on the less transparent, uh, uh, more difficult to, to evaluate, to value uh, positions on, on assets. Uh, on the, 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 the test, the stress test were quite, uh, quite tough. And nevertheless, uh, we did not uh, find uh, a lot of things. So this part uh, has been addressed faster than the, uh, non the classical non-performing exposures and for the time being, also because the, the banks learned the lesson of the, the, the crisis and they are much more prudent. Uh, there are a lot of uh, similar operations that have uh, totally disappeared uh, from the, uh, the operations that are uh, treated, uh, treated by the banks. Probably not forever, because we are human beings. We forget the lessons uh, of the crisis after a number of years. But for the time being, that's not uh, a major concern. 
And I can tell you that we uh, scrutinize this uh, very carefully. For example, we have, been, uh, we have done a lot of work on leverage finance that is starting to uh, develop uh, again uh, because uh, uh, it's a, a more easy source of uh, incomes uh, in a world with low interest uh, rates. But uh, there is no yet reasons to, to get concerned on we will act even before there are reasons because we will uh, publish uh, soon uh, recommendations on leverage finance operations. Um, it's something also you will find in reading the FCA report uh, that the, uh, indeed there is an increase in the leverage of uh, funds, but it's from, from 1.2 to 1.3. So as what Daniel said, it's, it's not yet worrying, but we're monitoring it. Uh, the lady in blue in the second, Row, please. Uh, yes, uh, Soledad Núñez from Bank of Spain. My question is also on interconnectedness or interdependencies. I see that there are some things that we, we are doing to reduce it, but at the same time, I have the, uh, the feeling that we are increasing in another way. For instance, uh, making mandatory uh, the the, the trading of the uh, OTC derivatives going to, through a CCP and give it, I mean, that we know that it's a huge market, especially on swaps, no? uh, and banking market, by the way. Uh, and knowing that a CCP just mutualizes risks and the, most of the members of CCPs are banks, then uh, don't you think that this is also increased interconnectedness? And, uh, and then, by the way, I, I, make, I take the opportunity to to make a second question, and it's on the resolution of CCPs. We know that uh, uh, the Commission has promised a, resol a, re a regulation or directive of uh, recovery and resolution for CCPs. And my question is on to Mrs. Elke. Uh, do you think that the, the single resolution mechanism should take care of resolution of CCPs, especially from those that, do, that are banks or that they are systematic, I mean, system, globally systemic? Thank you. I would enlarge the question to Elke because Elke happens also to be the chair of the RSG group in the FSB, so therefore she might have also substantive uh, thoughts to share on CCP resolution. Uh, I perfectly agree with you that we have created, and when I say we, I think supervi regulators, supervisors were very instrumental here, a new layer of interconnectedness when it comes to CCPs. This we did with very good reason because clearly the transparency of clearing via a platform compared to OTC I think is undoubted. But we have addressed, and when I say we, I think the Commission was first in saying they want to look into recovery and resolution of CCPs, and they are now very carefully monitoring and watching out what's, going, what's happening on the FSB level. There is ongoing work by CPMI IOSCO on stress testing, recovery, and a lot of work there, which I would call the, the part of self-regulation. The FSB Resolution Steering Group is working on the question, do we need to have dedicated resolution tools, or even more important, do we need, at what point would resolution kick in within a CCP framework? Do we also need to have, at that point, firm rules and regulation behind? This work is still in somehow early stages. You can expect a first college report that is trying to narrow the options for the G20 meeting in autumn. And I think then, based on that, I would assume that also the Commission then starts to take up. When I'm looking at it, nevertheless, and to be fair there, for me, the most important question is, at what point does a resolution authority need to step in? That's probably before you reach the end of the famous waterfall, because then you have just some naked bones left and <laughs> nothing else. But it is also the question, what will be the target? Because always considering that the CCP is 
a facilitator in itself. So how do you find back to a matched book to keep the clearing system up? And there are a lot of more technical questions and they all interfere, and that's the interest that the SRB has in, into the fact that roughly 90% of all those trades go via clearing members, which are roughly 10 of the GSIPs. So whatever is going to happen, if you come to this kind of tail event, which I hope is always really a tail event, will be an event that impacts the banks as well as the clearing members, and not just one clearing member. And I've now keep, kept out any kind of operational risk. Could warrant another session. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a topic sure. in, in, it, in itself. Uh, and uh, we will finish uh, with Philip. Uh, since you expressed the wish to put a question. So, so we talk a lot about regulation. So let, let's have one question on business, okay? Because in the end, it's uh, markets that have to drive the financial integration mm -hmm. that we all aspire for, and uh, the regulation should create the safety and that's needed, uh, but be also accommodating to that type of dynamics. So I would like to ask a question to Kurs Timmermans as one of the leading retail banks in, in Europe. Uh, you described very nicely the, um, the operations you have in different countries. And um, now in a banking union world at the stage where we were, many of us probably believed that there would be by now a, a few more uh, banks in the starting seats to pursue similar directions, to become truly European retail banks. And also for the direction that both the Commission and us we have in terms of financial risk sharing, this would be really important, that this actually materializes at a much larger scale than we have now. And so I wanted to ask you to give us, from a purely business, you mentioned a bit like large exposure, some obstacles that you saw on the regulatory side, so I've, I've taken note of this, but um, the question is on the business side. So what are the top three things that would have to happen, or is it realistic that now, as the banking union matures, um, that actually we're going to have a, uh, a, a larger share of operators operating retail uh, banking at a pan-European level? And what, how can we get there? Yeah, maybe from a business perspective, um, one of the things what we see on the retail side, if we look at trends, is the biggest trend by far is the way how clients are interacting with us read digitalization. And so during the crisis, what happened is people started to use the computer, then went uh, straight away to, from call centers, uh, iPads to mobile. And uh, so, so if you ask like, what is keeping us busy? The biggest part is, can we still follow the customer? Because they choose every time a new channel how to come to us. Now, what does that mean for us? It means for us, for instance, all client data needs to be outside of the product system or outside of the communication system with the clients because you want to be updated on all channels. Secondly, all products need to be sold by the device which is the simplest and the smallest, which is a telephone. And you, ca you can imagine you cannot have 37 pages of swiping before you say yes to a transaction. So banks are very busy with trying to do this digitalization. What we have not seen yet is retail customers internationalizing. So we have, if you ask really like, is it a big trend that you see European customers shopping Europe on the European level? The answer is no. Still, this is one of the parts which we do expect will happen. I mean, in the end, I mean, you know, European customers are going to Alibaba and European customers are going to other internet providers as well. So I think two things will clearly help and that is the one is the onboarding and the other one is a more European deposit guarantee scheme. Because then, I mean, you don't want as a customer to go somewhere, place a deposit in a bank and then first say like, well, let me read the country's deposit guarantee rules. I mean, in that sense, it's just too much work. Uh, if, if you really ask, are people interested to spend a tremendous amount of time on their finances? The answer is as convenient and as quick as possible because people just don't like it, which I can imagine. I mean, so that is why I think a simplification, European deposit guarantee scheme, at the same time also better onboarding rules, they will 
start to help to get more a European retail customer cross-border, and that is something which we haven't seen yet. Right, thank you, uh, Kos. We're precisely in time, because it's one minute before one. So I thank uh, all the panelists for their contributions, and thank you for your discipline as well. And uh, we break for lunch, and uh, we meet back, I assume, in this room after lunch. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.